المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Indeed all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, the month of Ramadan has started. And this month itself represents one of the tremendous blessings and favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. But Allah has informed us in the Qur'an that in prescribing fasting upon the Muslims, He did so not to deprive us of enjoyment, not to starve us, but rather to teach us an important concept an important attitude that we need in order to navigate as we say this life and stay on the straight path and that is that objective is the, the nurturing or development of taqwa a consciousness a higher consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muslims we believe that whatever Allah the Exalted has ordered or prohibited, that there is wisdom in it. There is reason, there is wisdom, there is hikmah. Whether we understand that read wisdom or not, there is always wisdom. Because Allah the Exalted, God Almighty, has no need to amuse Himself. So you and I may do things for the fun of it, but Allah the Exalted is far above doing anything just for the fun of it. He has no need to play around with His creations because He has power over all things. He has nothing to prove to anyone because He has power over all things. So in the institution of fasting, it is certainly there is wisdom behind this. There, is, there are reasons for it. One of them, as I mentioned, is the development of taqwa, a higher consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now before we talk a little bit about what exactly is the nature of taqwa, because I, I'm sure you hear this term a lot. But what is important is, us, is for us to explore the nature of this term, what is taqwa. But before we do that, I want to highlight and share with you some thoughts and ideas on why taqwa is important. Now, in verse 185 in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed as guidance for mankind. So in this ayah, Allah tells us that the Qur'an is guidance for mankind. But at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, ذَٰلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ In this book, there is no doubt, it is guidance for those who have taqwa. Muttaqeen is the, what we call the active participle. Ismu al-fa'il. From the verb ittaqa yattaqi, which means the person who has taqwa, or the people who have taqwa, plural. So in that verse, in 185, Allah says that the Quran is guidance for mankind, but here He tells us that the Quran in it, there is guidance for the muttaqin. Now, this may seem as a contradiction. How come Allah says in one place it is guidance for mankind, but here He limits it to the people who have a higher consciousness of him. 
Al Hafid ibn Kathir rahimahullah, in discussing this issue or this apparent contradiction, he said in his tafsir that there is no contradiction. Because in all the verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Quran being guidance from mankind, what these verses mean is that potentially the Quran is guidance for all of mankind. The guidance is there. So every human being has the same access to, the, to this guidance. No one is deprived from it. No one has better access than anyone else. It is not exclusive to anyone or any particular people. It is there for every single individual. However, he said, that in reality, only those who have nurtured some consciousness of Allah in their minds will actually benefit from the guidance of the Quran. So when Allah says that the Quran is guidance for the muttaqeen, what it means is those who will truly come to the Quran and benefit from this guidance in their lives are those who have taqwa. So the guidance is there. But in order for us to benefit from it, we need taqwa. And where do we get this taqwa from? You can't buy it in Canadian Tire. Can you? You can't. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, brothers and sisters, He made fasting compulsory in Ramadan upon us. Why? He said, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That perhaps you will develop taqwa. The same taqwa we need to actually and practically benefit from the guidance of the Qur'an. How do we achieve it? Or one means is to the institution of fasting in Ramadan. This is why. So by fasting in Ramadan, we develop a higher consciousness of Allah, which in itself leads to what? To now benefiting from the guidance in the Qur'an. And this actually is the strong connection between the revelation of the Qur'an in Ramadan and fasting in Ramadan. Allah revealed the Qur'an in Ramadan and He made fasting a compulsory upon us in Ramadan because of the taqwa. Taqwa is the common bond between the two. So now that we understand why we need taqwa, we need to look at what really is this taqwa then. Because we, without it, we cannot benefit from the guidance of the Qur'an. Without this taqwa, brothers and sisters, a person, even if he or she is Muslim, will not care about what the Qur'an has to say in terms of what is halal and what is haram. And we know, I mean, we have lived this experience where there are many people who say that they are Muslims, and yet they knowingly and deliberately contradict and violate certain principles and values in the Qur'an. Some even go as far as to say, that the Qur'an needs to be updated, that it is outdated, it's not applicable for our world today and our society today. So a person can say that they're Muslim, but without the taqwa, they will not benefit from the guidance that's there. But with the taqwa, a person can benefit. Once the person benefits, then Allah, that person is on the right path. So what is this taqwa? It's an interesting concept actually because it, it actually comprises of two components. The Khalifa Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, once when he was the Khalifa, he asked Ubay ibn Ka'b, and Ubay ibn Ka'b as you know or some of you may know, is one of the well-known reciters and scholars of the Qur'an among the Sahaba. Among the Sahaba. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith, he told the Sahaba, if you wanted to learn the Qur'an and know about the Qur'an, and he named some names, he says, go to these, go to these people. And among the, the Sahaba, he mentioned Ubay bin Ka'b. You go to them to learn the Qur'an. So Umar anhu said to Ubay, what is taqwa? What is the nature of taqwa? What is its reality, its definition? And Ubay radiallahu anhu said to him, Have you ever walked at a path that was full of thorns? Have you ever walked on a path that is full of thorns? Now I hope you know what thorns are. Alright, there, there are certain plants that have these thorns in them, growing on them to protect the leaves of course. 
And you know, if you've had experience with these plants, that you need to be very careful. If you're not careful, your clothing can easily get snagged in the thorns. Or you can even hurt yourself. You can prick your hand or your feet easily. So Ubay asked Umar, have you ever walked on such a path? And Umar said to him, yes, I did. And Ubay said to him, what did you do? Umar radiallahu anhu said, shammartu thumma jtahadtu. Shamartu means I gathered my clothing around me so that there were no loose clothing because it's the loose ones, the loose ends of clothing that could easily get snagged on the thorns. So he said, Shamartu, I gathered my clothing around me. And then I worked hard. Ijtahadtu means to work hard. So if somebody is mujtahid, they're working hard. All right, then. Uh, when we were learning Arabic, one of the early uh, statements we learned is Talibul Mujtahid, a hardworking student. So he said, Thumma Jtahadu, then I worked hard. Work hard in doing what? In carefully selecting where you will place where, where he will place his feet so he will not be hurt by the thorns. Because you can gather your clothing around you, but if you're not careful in where you're walking, you may step on a thorn and hurt yourself. So he said that's what he did. He gathered his clothing around him and he worked hard or he was careful in selecting where he was placing his feet. His feet. And Ubay radiallahu anhu said to him, taqwa. That is taqwa. And this is a beautiful uh, uh, hadith because it actually tells us and defines for us and clears for us the nature of taqwa. So taqwa, as I said, comprises of two things. Number one, based on this exchange between Ubay and Umar, it is a presence of mind. You have to know where you are. That's why Ubay asked him, did you walk on this path? He said, yes. What did you do? Right Now you know where you are. You have to have the presence of mind. And then that consciousness or that presence of mind doesn't end there. Here comes the second component, and that is the necessary actions that the consciousness must affect. Because remember, Umar anhu did not just say, look, yes, I walked on such a path. He did something though, while walking on the path. So he was conscious he was on the path, and that consciousness of the type of path he was walking on resulted in him doing certain things. And that is what taqwa is. It's, it's a consciousness, it's a mindset, a mental attitude, if you like, that a Muslim has to have or should have. And that mindset now affects the actions we do. So taqwa is not just a consciousness, if a theoretical consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, that consciousness is also translated into actions. It is manifested in actions. How do we know that the consciousness is there? Through the actions. And when we understand taqwa from this perspective, then we realize that it is a very loaded term as we say. When Allah refers to people as muttaqeen, there are certain, right away, there are certain implications and meanings to the word muttaqeen. So taqwa, brothers and sisters, is not just an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in addition to the awareness, awareness, our actions must be influenced by that awareness. Our behavior, our attitude. So taqwa is that mental attitude we have that guides us to do this and to avoid that. This is taqwa. In this, Allah mentions in this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah as the objective of the institution of fasting. Because if a person has taqwa, brothers and sisters, then, masha'Allah, you have everything. If a person is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will actively do what is good, and they will also actively avoid that which is wrong, that which is evil, that which is sinful. And that really, if you look at it, is the essence of being Muslim. This is the objective of being a Muslim. Doing what is good, avoiding what is wrong. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, He praises the Muslims for this same quality of doing good, avoiding what is wrong. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Allah says you were the best nation. The Muslim nation is the best nation ever raised up among mankind and there were other nations before. Why? What makes the Muslim nation the better nation? Allah says, تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ You enjoy the good. You do it yourself and you, you encourage others to do it. وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And you forbid the wrong or the evil. You yourself don't commit the evil or the wrong and you also encourage others not to. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ يُبُلِيهِ بِنَ اللَّهِ So if a person has taqwa, then mashaAllah, everything sort of falls into place as we say. So in this month as we fast, we need to develop taqwa. The thing is though, how do we develop it? We understand what it is. We know what the nature of taqwa is, but how do we get there? How does a person elevate or raise his or her consciousness of Allah? Well, there is no secret to this really. And there is no miracle or magic either. It comes through striving to do good things, intentionally, deliberately, and at the same time, deliberately and intentionally striving to avoid the things that are prohibited. And it is this repetition of doing good, avoiding evil, doing good, avoiding evil, day after day, and when we talk about doing good, by the way, brothers and sisters, it's anything that's good, mashaAllah. So, you know, whether it is dhikr, it is recitation of the Qur'an, reading a translation of the Qur'an, reading books on hadith or fiqh, helping people, being kind, smiling with people, being gentle with them, being forgiving, being tolerant, being compassionate, Doing good is doing good. There's nothing specific, including, of course, you know, doing your prayers, doing your sunnah prayers, doing your nafal prayers, your taraweeh, your qiyam. So everything good that a person does, willingly and freely, helps to nurture a higher consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with the repetition, the consciousness increases and, and stays there. That's why we fast, not just for a day or two, but for a whole month, 29 or 30 days. Because repetition is important in order to teach us, to get us into the habit of doing things. And this is why all of us, we've had this experience where even at our jobs, you know, as you train and you practice and you do more and more, you become better at it. At least train all the time. A person suddenly just doesn't wake up one day and they're excellent at a certain sport or activity. You have to train and practice. And with time and with the practice and the hard work, you will get there. And that's why we repeat this. We fast every day for 30 days or 29 days. And every day we're doing more or less the same thing, aren't we? We're fasting, we're not eating, we're not drinking. We avoid saying anything bad or insultive or indecent. We also try to avoid behaving in an indecent manner. We try to be helpful, we try to be kind, mashallah. Every day, the same things we're doing. So no one should get bored, by the way, because the repetition is training. We're learning how to do the good things. And we're learning, the body is becoming accustomed to, the mind is becoming accustomed to avoiding the evil things. So the repetition is good and necessary, actually. It's necessary for us to, mashallah, once Ramadan is over, to have developed these good habits. These good habits. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed from mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help each one of us and guide us so that we may develop a higher consciousness of Him in this month of fasting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Help us and guide us to do the good deeds with which He is pleased. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fasting, our prayers, our du'as, and all our good deeds. And may He forgive for us our mistakes, our shortcomings, 
أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته